That works. That's an easy job. Yeah, <laughs> Um, okay, thank you so much for um, getting for giving me the opportunity to um, to talk here today, and um, to participate in this amazing um, boot camp and and program that I've already learned an immense amount from. So I'll talk about a bunch of topics that can be unified by the general theme of updating dynamics and networks. Although we'll see that there's a lot more going on. So a basic motivation, which I'll be very quick about, but offer some complimentary um, thoughts to what Matt said yesterday, is that basic motivation in this area is that people are influenced by others. And learning and information is a very important form of that. But there are other peer effects, like collaborating with others or not wanting your opinions to be too different from those, the opinions around you, um, keeping up not wanting to fall behind a peer or setting your aspirations, what you think you can, you know, what's reasonable to aspire to based on what people around you are, are trying to do. Those are, you know, there's good empirical evidence, but I think introspection convinces us that those things are real. And Matt alluded to this yesterday, you know, in one of the big leaders in this field in economics is uh, Sasserdot, who has many papers, but here's an example where using random assignments of roommates, you're able to actually assess these kinds of peer effects in a school effort kind of setting and educational effort. There's a paper that became famous because among other things it made um, social science a lot, more, a, lot, a lot more frictional in some ways with Facebook data, but this was a paper that made a big splash by manipulating people's Facebook feeds and getting very well identified evidence because of the very large populations they could work with of emotional contagion through networks. So we have evidence that, that peer effects in, in information and other things are real. And then in other studies, we have effects, we have studies of, we have evidence on how important information can be. So um, Rob Jensen went and delivered information about schooling in a poor Central American country, just held a hour-long seminar with people informing them of the wages for middle school and high school completion and then measured that was a randomized control trial found that people got a quarter of a year more of schooling which is an enormous effect in economics but even more enormous when you divide by the cost of one NGO worker talking to people for an hour um, and so um, another study by Pascaline Dupas found that with young um, African women informing them about which behaviors were highest risk uh, for HIV um, had big impacts with the, which they could measure by looking at the proxy of um, teen pregnancy. Um, they could immediately see that, though the, you know, the long-run consequences for disease are, are harder to measure, but teen pregnancy fell by 28% because of an informational intervention. So you put these two things together, People are influenced by others, and information can have big, big, you know, movements, especially dividing by physical costs. Let me say that more carefully. Information has a huge bang for the buck, especially when you consider how cheap it is physically to make information flow on people's behavior. And it's not a mystery that lots of lots of policymakers implement network-based policies um, targeting leaders or designing their programs in some way intended to take advantage of these network effects and leverage you know, the impact of networks to deliver information and ultimately change behavior. And so that takes us to a somewhat different topic from the one Matt was thinking about yesterday. So yesterday, we were focusing mostly on polarization and segregation and these things. But when we think of like a whole population, this closely related question, if we're going to, you know, if we want to know how networks change behavior, you might be curious about the question of just like, what would you do to this network if you wanted, what, what would you do to people's opinions if you wanted to change their behavior? And how does the network mediate that? So who are the leaders in a network? Whose opinion would you want to focus on changing if you could? Um, now, there are a lot of modeling choices to make when you try to make that into a math problem. Am I going to use continuous or discrete actions for my agents? Are they gonna be very simple behaving in some kind of, are they like physical particles or are they kind of sophisticated economic optimizing agents? Are my dynamics gonna be deterministic or more realistic and stochastic? Um, is my network going to be fixed or changing 
in response to maybe random shocks or maybe even in response to the opinion dynamics. So that those things have come up. The De Groot model, which I'm going to focus on today for a while, is a workhorse, which is one extreme and important point in this space. It's continuous in actions, very simple in terms of how agents think, deterministic, and uh, the network is fixed. Um, because of that simplicity, it's mathematically very straightforward, especially for this crowd to analyze, but it's become an important benchmark for situations where if we started with other models, like the rational models that ec economists tend to be fond of, various questions involving networks are just completely, can't even get started. The De Groot model gave us sort of a first place where we got traction, and then we, we um, have gone far from that. So it's a reference point from which to explore other assumptions. And as I'll mention, every single one of these assumptions that, that so you'll be tempted to ask, and you began to ask yesterday, how about this extreme assumption in the De Groot model? Could you relax it? And for every single one, there's great work, recent work, and these are research topics in many cases, um, relaxing those assumptions. But I'm gonna start by, by telling you a little more than Matt did um, about the basic core benchmark model. So let's start with that. Um, so here's, the, here's our founding father. Um, in 1974, Morris de Groot published this paper in JASA. Um, and he was thinking about, I don't, want you to read this page. This is a more of a, a history item. But um, at that time, there was a research area in statistics on opinion pooling. This was actually before, if you happen to know about Aumann and interactive epistemology and Bayesian updating, it was before people were thinking about opinion updating that way, really. He was just, they were thinking about it much more heuristically. And ad hoc, de Groot asked, what are reasonable procedures that a team of statisticians might use to evolve their beliefs about, um, he was actually thinking about a distribution. You can see a distribution over omega. People had distributions over the weather or what have you, and he wanted to think about pooling them, and he formulated this model that Matt has already introduced. Well, so um, let me just, for the sake of being self-contained, I'll put the updating rule again. Um, I'm using a different symbol from Matt, but otherwise it's what you saw yesterday. There's a square non-negative matrix whose rows sum to one. And the dynamics of the model are about the behavior of this vector of opinions or estimates or actions. Let's say for, for now, there'll be real numbers. You can substantially generalize that, but there's just a real valued opinion that everybody holds at each time. Um, and the law of motion of the model is as simple as could be. Every period, the way you form your next period opinion is by taking a weighted average of last period opinions, including maybe your own. Here's a little example. Mr. One here cares 0.6 about his own past opinion, 0.3 about Ms. Two, 0.1 about Ms. Three, and so he aggregates them in this way. Couldn't be simple, right? And Matt already showed this, this picture. I'm going to play through the video again of this little dark opinion, maybe we call that one opinion, kind of spreading out. Initially, it spreads out you know, very close to where it started, but after a while, it makes its way all around. And yesterday, Matt was interested in the gradient, which you can to some extent see in this picture of the colors on the top being a little darker than lighter than the colors at the bottom. And we'll get back to that. But the question of what is this color even, right? Like what shade of black are they going to get? That is itself a question, one that we answered yesterday and we'll dig more into the answer, or we, we began to answer yesterday and we'll dig more into that today. Well, here's the answer. And this is really, this is a result that De Groot stated. Um, Everyone converges to a consensus opinion. Matt told us the conditions under, under which that's true. We had to assume W was strongly connected as a directed graph and aperiodic. But the consensus that they reach can be written as a linear combination of initial opinions. And the weights, the weights are what I want to talk about. And this is what we didn't talk about yesterday. So. These weights, so the weight on I is how much I matters in determining the consensus opinion. Um, well, it's, it turns out that it's eigenvector centrality in this network given by W. The defining property of eigenvector centrality is, well, first it's a distribution on the people. So it's a vector of non-negative numbers summing to one, a number for every person. And what defines eigenvector centrality is that my centrality is a weighted average of other people's centralities. Weighted by what? 
weighted by how much they pay attention to me in their updating. That's the condition that E is a left-hand eigenvector of the matrix W. It's a linear version of the statement that your importance is the sum of the attention paid to you. This is a different way to say the weighting. The sum of the, the attention, the W that people pay to you weighted by the importance of those paying. It. And it's a notion of centrality that was studied before this, before the group, in fact, in sociology. Oh. W is normalized so that if you sum over J, you get one, or if you sum over I. If you sum any row, you get one. And so, and whereas here we're doing E on the left, so this is sort of going over the column, right? So, so sum over so W to I. That, that can be, no, some of the rows are, the rows are add up to one, the columns can add up to anything. So it's a transpose of a random walk. Depending on your religions about random walks, yes. <laughs> um, and so in bibliometry, Kendall and Way, and then, you know, more recently and profitably, the um, Brennan Page studied this measure as a as a assignment of importance to nodes in a network. Um, and we'll see tomorrow actually that or Friday that the same measures have been interesting in macroeconomics um, where people have studied models where it turns out centralities also matter. So the intuition is why is it in, let's let me give you a moment. So I'll well if you, maybe you read quickly, think for a moment about why it makes sense that your influence in this model should obey this fixed point condition. Here's the answer. If you are willing to believe me that your influence is going to be a number, That is uh, that the ultimately the consensus opinion will be some kind of linear combination of initial opinions. Then, you know, the way that I can have influence, the, the impact of changing my time zero opinion has to somehow be mediated by what happens at time one. So if at time zero you move my opinion, how's that going to affect the consensus? Well, by changing my friends' opinions at time one and then doing stuff after that. And the amount that it's going to matter is how much those friends pay attention to me. Right, multiplied by how influential they themselves are in the subsequent evolution. So if you think about that, it implies it's, it gives you this, this equation. And um, incidentally, you know, for I, when I teach basic Markov chain stuff, this process, which of course, you know, to both Matt began to say this, and I just want to make it very explicit. In this model, xt is equal to w to the power t x zero. So everything is, all, of course, about the behavior of w to the power t, but it can be a useful, um, change of, if you were trying to prove, for example, stuff about this matrix converging, actually thinking about this process can be in some ways more intuitive than thinking about the Markov chain directly as a probabilistic object. So you can, you can it's a nice little exercise to write a proof of the conditions for convergence of a Markov chain from this perspective rather than the traditional one. But that's all, you know, what I want to, what I want to think about is that once you see this, once you have a measure of influence, um, you might get interested in the following if you were a marketer, you would, you would think the following, that we know that degree is very unequal in real life social networks. And if you thought that degree might be predictive of influence, if you thought that how connected someone was, was gonna make them you know, more, more connected, was gonna be more influential, then you might get excited because in fact, degree distributions, follow a power law in the tail, or to some extent at least. That's one of the celebrated stylized facts of, of kind of first generation network science. And so this was a picture from 2011 Facebook. Um, and you see on the log log plot, this is the um, counter cumulative CDF on the log log plot, you see this telltale linear bit, which says that here, the distribution of degrees decays polynomially and what that means is in such a world, um, you might have a small fraction of people having a large fraction of the influence, okay? But I jumped kind of to degrees. What do degrees have to do with anything, right? Here, this, this eigenvector, this E, certainly isn't degree in general. 
So let me tell you first about a cool little um, workhorse model for this. If you take an undirected weighted graph G, so G is a, is a symmetric matrix with non-negative numbers, um, that's all I'm going to require. And you define W, your updating matrix, by normalizing G. So what does this mean? How much attention I pay to you is how closely we're related in this graph divided by my total links in this graph. So DI is your degree in this weighted graph. Uh, then it will turn out that your, it, it's a little proposition, it's a fact that eigenvector centrality is proportional to degree. So if I want to know your influence in the sense we just discussed, it's actually just going to be the sum of your link weights. And here it doesn't matter whether I sum row or column because G is a symmetric matrix, right? So this is a little exercise that I, it, it, I encourage you to assign if you teach this at an undergrad level, it's exactly the same exercise as, as um, understanding the symmetric random walk on a graph. If you have a graph and you have a Markov chain constructed by taking steps at random on G, then you prove that the stationary distribution has this some um, property. It's just your degree in an unweighted graph. It's proportional to degree. This is the same fact, right? Well, now we, we can directly, so if we, if we thought that the world was like this, which is a simple benchmark, then let me give you a little targeting proposition, a very direct corollary mathematically, but one with some um, importance about targeting to shift behavior. Suppose you have a marketing tool, like an ad that you can show people that's going to change their behavior by delta on average. And you can show it to some people. Who should you show it to? Well, the value of targeting a set of agents in this world is their total centrality. That's what the, the result one said. And so with a heavy tailed degree distribution, and now we know at least in this type of setup, influence is degree. With heavy tailed distributions of degree, a small share of agents can hold a large share of total influence. So you can you might have you know my the colors didn't uh, didn't render quite how I was hoping. There's a cutoff here where fewer than ten percent of the people have in this in an example more than fifty percent of the total. You know, if you take the expectation in the tail here of EI, you get a small tail having a big share of influence. And so this gives a strong rationale for targeting influencers. Targeting the right few percent of people can be much better than targeting a much larger fraction of typical people. So is it worth finding these influentials? In this model, it can be under the right conditions. That's like a, a free immediate punchline of the Degroot model. Any, any questions or anything up until this point? All right, so let's push, let's push on and get. So this is a summary of, this is sort of Degroot theory. In terms of the history, Degroot kind of effectively knew almost all of this and, but, more in the last 10 or 15 years, people have gotten excited about connecting. For De Groot, this was just a math result, and he, he stated it in terms of a stationary distribution. But the fact that this is connected to centrality measures and economic uh, and, and things that sociologists were interested in anyway um, has sort of you know, been a fruitful connection between um, social sciences and, and these kinds of things. I actually want to say one thing, that the sociologists were studying the eigenvector centrality equation just for its own sake. They thought it captured something intuitive about social prestige, that you're important if, you, if you're an important person, if important people pay attention to you. And De Groot kind of gives us a foundation, if you'd like, for that. If opinions are updating according to De Groot, then your influence happens to be proportional to this um, measure of, of centrality that people thought was kind of interesting or plausible independently. So it's kind of an interesting intellectual confluence that, that these two different areas came to the same idea by different routes. But I want to talk about something practical. I want to talk about something um, real world. So around the time that Matt and I had been working on this and Matt was very interested in these network updating models, um, he, wor he started working with Banerjee, Chandrasekhar, Duflo, and Jackson on, on <laughs> Selfridge, um, taking these insights to the field. And uh, they had an interesting data set. There was a intervention where an NGO had taken um, a microfinance program and brought information about it to leaders in villages, who we call seeds because they're the seeds from which information spreads. And it happened that you know they had a certain procedure for delivering the information, but the seed sets had different 
amounts of total centrality. And how do we know that? We know that because after the NGO did, did its work, or uh, actually, I don't, it, was, it was after, right? Or during? Was it? The sen so the census occurred sort of, yeah. So there was a network census that they did where they, they measured the networks in which the, the villagers communicated. They asked them a whole bunch of questions about all their relationships. And they were able to then see that the NGO's procedure ended up seeding sets with very different centrality, different, very different levels of centrality in these different villages. And so this is a plot where on the x-axis we have the this is a slight variant of eigenvector centrality, but it's very closely related. The, the, over, the total centrality of the leaders and the ultimate take up, the ultimate participation rate in the program where information about which information was seeded. And so it turns out that among a bunch of right-hand side variables, including, you know, is this, a per, is this person a teacher or a shopkeeper in the village, um, their degree, other network measures, the, total centrality of the seeds in the sense was the most predictive of total of eventual take up. And later, the same team did a did a random a randomized trial where, in, where um, this was observational data because they didn't, the NGO was doing its own seeding for its own reasons. Later, they did a gold standard randomized trial with kind of testing the same principles and again found causal evidence that higher seed set centrality predicts higher eventual take up. So one thing that I want to note about the evolution of this research area is that, you know, I've presented it in this one way, but over the decade that this research has been happening, it's not like we knew from the beginning what the right models were to, to model diffusion. And in fact, the model written down in the science paper was mostly an epidemic, a more epidemic style model, like the ones you've been hearing about in the epidemic lectures. So what is this line? Is that just a linear fit? That's just a, uh, yeah, least squares line with a, an error, with a kind of error bar. Because if I'm not forced to put the line, I would put the parabola, would be one of two. Which, which way would your parabola occur? I could first go down and then go up. I see, yeah. So it would be, yeah, do you have anything to, have you done nonlinear? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it would be a better fit with a nonlinear. Uh-huh. But would you get this? So me, it looks as if a shift in monotonicity. At first, it seems to sort of go down and then goes up. Oh, you see, you're saying that here. Yeah. So you know, I wouldn't. Um, I think that the economists, incidentally, were were not keen on mining this data too much because it was an observational study. So at some level, you could think that it doesn't. You know, the seeding wasn't done based on centrality. So it. So I think they wanted to keep the data analysis minimal so that they wouldn't be. You know overfitting an observational study. But I think we now do have evidence that this is. So what I want to point out is that, and I'll say more about this later, the viral epidemic models actually wouldn't give you in nearly as natural a way a rationale for in this high these high centrality sets being better as seed sets. It was, it's really the linear after, after you know 10 years of thinking about it, I think the literature is converging to thinking that models like the one I'm presenting today with continuous actions and these kind of eigenvector uh, characterizations are more, um, seem to fit better, at least the aggregate data uh, for explaining these kind of facts. Yeah. Because we have presented a different type of centrality. I'm wondering what are the intuitions for choosing this particular type of diffusion That's a great question. I mean, as a general matter, you want to choose, I, so, um, hopefully you choose something that tracks the process you think is diffusing the information. Um, and then there's a separate question that different kinds of theories make different predictions. So you could throw in, you know, multiple kinds of, and in the science paper, in fact, they did have multiple right-hand sides that they tried and they found that the diffusion centrality was the, the centrality measures they focus on, which is, I think, almost exclusively diffusion in the end, right? Eigenvector and... Yeah, I mean, we did uh, degree in between this and a bunch of others, but this one comes out as the best. Fit. Yeah, so in some sense, as a, as a sort of like, you know, empirical social scientist, you think this one seems to be fitting. So that suggests that these processes might be the relevant ones. Um, and, and I think, you know, as a, as a little methodological perspective on network theory, I think the value of having so many excellent theories developing is that we develop a heuristic understanding of what matters for viral processes, what matters for degree processes. We'll see what matters for network games. 
you put them together, it gives you a toolbox that when you look at a real life process, based on what you see mattering or happening, you can say, okay, this is going to be the kind of model I'm going to um, bring to it because it fits the fact, you know, it has these stylized facts that look like model X, right? And I think it's taken, even though it feels very simple in hindsight, um, it, it wasn't obvious at all that these kinds of diffusion, so for now, just do me a favor and think of diffusion centrality as very closely related to eigenvector, and I'll tell you more about it soon. Um, so I want to talk quickly about something maybe a little, a little um, different, which is that, so, so far we've been focused on the marketer who's like, who wants opinions to move in a certain direction and is interested, like, who can I influence to do this? Here's a different question, very different. It's about aggregation. So um, this is from a paper Matt and I wrote called Naive, the first paper we wrote about this stuff, Naive Learning in Social Networks and the Wisdom of Crowds, which is actually the first paper I ever published. Um, and we were interested, if you know Francis Galton's Wisdom of Crowds, famous you know, thought experiment and then re real experiment um, about aggregating information from a lot of people that is often used in teaching, we took his setting and brought it to a network. So the setup is that people have in, people's initial opinions are independent private signals of a truth. So think the theta is some unknown variable. We don't know much about it. Let's say we have an un, uninformative prior, but we do get signals and everybody's signal is an independent signal of theta with a mean zero error. That's just a definition of epsilon. And the errors can have all different you know, variances. So there's gonna be some interval of variances um, of people's different signals. And the basic question is, when is consensus close to the truth? When is the, after talking a la de Groot, when will people believe something pretty accurate? Well, here's a little, um, so let's think about that. Um, let's remember, first of all, that consensus is eigenvector weighted initial opinions. And we see pretty quickly that we're interested in a sort of you know, if we, and I guess one thing we should note immediately is that if the population is small, if you have five people, then no matter how they're connected, there are going to be fundamental limitations to how well they can learn about this data. They just don't have that much information. But if the population is kind of big, then you might hope that they might get enough information. And then the question is, will the network help them aggregate it correctly? So these people get the information, but they don't talk in a centralized way. They don't put all their guesses in a common bin so that we can do our little undergraduate class exercise. They just chat, a la de Groot. And when will they aggregate well? Well, so let's bound. We can write a little simple bound on the error in consensus. And I'm going to first be interested in an L2. You know, I'm going to bound the variance, or sorry, the, the, the expected squared error of their, um, of their guess. So consensus is C. And here I've just written variance of consensus in a funny way, right? Well, I know that I know that what consensus is from the right-hand side. So by this a standard variance formula, I can write it as a sum of the squares of the weights in the consensus times the variance of the individual people's deviations from the truth, which are epsilon. And I can bound that. Now, what am I using here? So E bar is defined to be the maximum of anybody's eigenvector centrality. So if you have a star where there's one person in the middle and everybody's paying, everybody has a link to that person, you can calculate that person's centrality will be a half, no matter how big the star is. And so maximum centrality will be a half. If you have some kind of symmetric network, like a circle or a complete graph, everybody's centrality will be one over n by symmetry, right? And so E bar is the maximum centrality. Well, we can bound this. If I just factor out an E out of each one of these, then I can bound this like this. And I'm going to lazily bound the variance of the opinions by the maximum variance. And then I observe that this guy, the sum of the EIs, by definition, adds up to 1. So that tells me this upper bound of EV, of E bar V bar. So the maximum, the bar on this, uh, variance of the consensus is the maximum variance times the maximum centrality. And yeah, if I then, you, yeah. Your epsilon i's are not independent. Are there also analysis for that? Or ah, yes. So you can do any, bring whatever we, exactly, bring whatever weak law, triangular array result you want, and you can apply it here, right? Um, 
And so then applying Chebyshev, once we see immediately that the probability that the consensus deviates by um, that the consensus deviates from the truth by some delta can be bounded by stuff. Let's treat everything as constants except the the maximum centrality. So I want what I really want to think about is a sequence of networks which is growing, and you know larger and larger networks. Each of them has a maximum centrality, and you can see that what you're going to need for this number to grow small. Say you fix delta to be a small number, you know 0.01. What you need is that e bar, the maximum centrality, is going to decay. So let's kind of make that statement. If I fix everything, the bounds on variance, I fix positive numbers here and consider a sequence of networks, you can very immediately show that. So in the asymptotic framework, what's the question? It is, does the consensus converge in probability to the truth? If a sequence of networks has that property, we say it's a wise sequence of, of networks, right? And it turns out you can immediately see from this calculation and a little, a little side exercise that's going to happen if and only if the maximum centrality decays to zero as your network grows large. So, yeah. I mean, so of course, Trebuchet gives you the upper bound, and we see that if this goes to zero, that probability will go to zero. How do you get it to be an if and only if statement? So I. I said that the lower bound on variance is going to be uh, fair enough. I forgot about the lower yeah. So can you assume the centrality anomaly in the sense that all the bits on sum of the one are it's, it's it's a definite, I mean, so the defining property pins down E up to scale. And we typically normalize it to one, which is a free normalization, you know, but it does help. The normalization helps with these calculations, so it's the one we use. Um, other questions? So um, let me say something super quick. I, I want to I actually, there is a kind of graph on question. So, so far, you know, I, I wouldn't blame you if you've been sitting here thinking that um, this is all mathematically quite straightforward so far, but it's kind of interesting. It's surprising how quickly you can reach a question that I still don't know the answer to. So before I say that one, I'll quickly say, you know, the eigenvector centrality vector is not the most intuitive object for, for everyone. And so a natural question people ask is like, well, what does it take to keep this away from zero? And so one simple answer is a prominent group, right? So let me make a little definition. We're going to call a group alpha prominent if everybody outside the group pays at least alpha attention to it. Now, maybe directly, maybe just they directly put weight total alpha on people in that group, but it would be okay if they do it indirectly too. So in, in two or three steps of this degree updating or 10 or whatever, if they put, if they ultimately have arrows in the matrix W to the power T that add up to at least alpha into that group, we're gonna call the group prominent, right? And so it's very immediate, and this is a simple little exercise, again, suitable for an undergraduate course, that if M is alpha prominent, then you can give a lower bound on the maximum centrality in the group. It's going to be lower bounded by, you know, something about alpha, and then divided by the cardinality of M. So if you have a sequence of networks, and in each of these networks, you have a prominent group of size, let's say, at most 12, then no matter how big the networks get, they're not, you're not going to get the wisdom condition. You can think of that as something like, the media or the Kardashians or whoever, right, who absorbs a non-vanishing share of the influence in the population, no matter how big the population gets. And so that's a, that's a very straightforward anti-wisdom result. It's an obstruction. So prominence is an obstruction to wisdom. Let me close by saying one tiny thing. So here's something I don't know. And I think, so I try to intersperse open questions into this. And I, I think I'm going to leave them mostly to the end if I have time, but I will very quickly say one, uh, one, quest, one, one open question now. Let me just say it now. Um, we actually still, Matt and I were very curious in 2010 about the other thing. What does it take for wisdom to be achieved? And I still don't feel like I know a great answer. So, you know, this is a very simple Markov chain question. Take a sequence of Markov matrices, the nth one of size n, and the question is, under what hands-on conditions that you can tell me not using the word eigenvector, will the maximum entry of the eigenvector decay to zero as you grow your matrix, right? So if you have, um, if you have my little toy 
favorite example where influence is ultimately degree, this thing that comes from an unweighted graph, the, ans the answer is trivial. You just need the, you need nobody to have a degree that's a positive share of total degree, right? That's kind of as, as explicit an answer as you can hope for. But if we move away from these nice W, in Markov chain language, you're now in the world of non-reversible Markov chains. And I asked, so I, I asked, I, actually, when we were doing this, I asked Percy Diaconis and I convinced him, you know, that it was, he, I at least got him intrigued, but I haven't, I, I don't know really what, what is an answer that, I don't know even know what a nice answer would look like. We have some results in the paper with Matt, but it seems like having some good understanding of the limit of WN could give you a condition, right? Especially, so here's, a, to make this- again or not? No, now it can be any Markov chain. You talk about Erich Van Hermann and Markov, so what is the- No, so W, sorry, W here is an arbitrary, I mean, the, I want conditions on an arbitrary W. Okay, that's your ER, so I've come from some of the um, Oh, so we're, oh, okay, so here, now here's a, here's a concrete question, that even this question I don't know the answer to. Suppose you have a, a Erich Van random graph with, let's say, um, you, you know, you can make the degrees what you want, log of n or something, or you can make it dense. And suppose we draw weights then randomly. So we make the ER graph and then the weights will be random subject to the graph. So you have 10 friends and you're gonna allocate your friends according to some, allocate your weights to your friends, Dirichlet, let's say, right? Some distribution. It sure seems like there's no excuse, no reason that influence should pile up here or there. But I think even this question, if you have this randomly drawn weights on a big Markov chain, um, you know, will will the maximum influence decay? I don't know. I would be if if some of you know methods, I would love to hear them. As we discussed, isn't it related to expansion properties of uh, uh, expand yeah, but, the type of thing? Yes, but I want to say that most most expander most expander stuff that I know yeah. works in the Markov chain world. It tends to work in the reversible case, which you know, in in the case maybe you know results that. I don't. I mean, I'm talking more about uh, irrelevant to the Markov chain, just the graph, as a graph property. So I can think of the weighted graphs and you can somehow define the Chiba constant type of edge expansion or vertex expansion or the isoparametric type of thing. Then it certainly has to do with, of course, the second eigenvalue of the whatever. But then it seems like that it has to do with influence or whatever other things that you're talking about. There is wait, a little wait, wait. bit of connection. But this Chiba bounds require you making your makers, but you might you usually have a first amount of chains. Yeah, a Chiba constant can be defined in that on the random walk sense, like partner uh, neck ratio, but in a purely graph graph theoretic sense. But this so like, graph is direct. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know your, your issue is always directly exactly. Direct. So, it is. <laughs> so exactly. So it is. So with exactly. So I think there are there are already challenging math problems, and so I'll leave it there. Let me just super quickly summarize and move on to the next chapter. So in this world, someone's weight in the consensus is determined by the network, independent of initial opinions, if you paid attention to the formulas, and equal to a celebrated measure of network centrality. It gives a rationale for targeting influentials if you want to move the opinions in the group. And this turns out to be in contrast, and Amin mentioned this briefly yesterday, in discrete action models, where, where a celebrated paper is by uh, Kempe, Tardos, and Kleinberg, and then a nice recent paper by uh, Amin and co-authors, saying that with viral type diffusion, the rationale for network-based targeting can be weaker. With these kinds of continuous action models, there's a very strong rationale, and it's the one that's emerged as sort of the workhorse model in economics. And as a sort of complement to this result, if we, want to, if we want a network to aggregate information, well, we don't want there to be influentials. We want, we want a, kind of spread, a kind of democratic network condition, which I, I think we still don't understand well, but it, captures the intuition that if you don't satisfy it, um, influential, the idiosyncratic error of these influential people will be overweighted and mislead the crowd. We have another question. Yes. In the Tartos paper, you mentioned this the potential problem with the even cycles. Do you have to, in order to analyze condition on the, the subgraph conditioning type of, uh, because this conflict for whatever, I, I forgot the name of this, four cycle of length four, but yeah, so I think in other in our world cycles. Any cycle, I guess. Yeah, we don't have. I mean, a periodicity I do is a very weak condition to satisfy. Once you're out, once you don't have periodicity, nothing combinatorial matters. No cycles. You're conditioning really on the periodicity. Of exactly. Periodicity, yeah. yeah, which is a very realistic condition in real social networks. I'm not going to have time to do this. I will put the slide up here. It's in the YouTube video. 
But basically any question you could ask, as I mentioned, you know, do you want to make your weight stochastic? Do you want your links? Maybe I stop listening to you if our opinions are too far apart. Um, these extensions have been studied. I'll flag this beautiful paper, which is a working paper by some um, excellent MIT students and uh, Surya Voglio, which, which is the cutting edge model on this kind of topic and has a great bibliography. People have combined diffusion type models and voter type models with De Groot. You know, there's some technical connections even with classic voter models, which are surveyed in this Mosul Tammuz survey. There's a nice AER paper very recently by Banerjee and uh, co-authors about combining a viral model and then De Groot. So people become aware of an issue virally. You become aware that there's such a thing as a microfinance program, and then you form opinions about it De Groot wise. So people are combining them and it leads to some very interesting math with Voronoi sets and subtleties that don't emerge in the standard De Groot model. And there's a sort of textbook for this part of the lecture, which is a survey I have with Sadler, um, which overviews a lot about the De Groot model, including questions of why would a statistician um, adopt a De Groot type updating rule. And actually in a recent paper with Dasratha and Haq, we have a foundation where if the world is changing, if theta is not fixed, but a AR1 stochastic process, a mean reverting process, then there's actually a rationale, even if you're fully Bayesian, for updating your beliefs in a degree way, updating your estimates in a degree way. So it's a rich subject that still has a lot of, a lot of, I've given you a very elementary kind of way into it, but I encourage you to check out any of these if you want a pretty immediate dive into some deep questions that we still don't um, have a full handle on. I already told you about this. So um, I'm gonna, it's also obviously extremely relevant for practice, but what Matt pointed out yesterday, and this is a quote that I got from a paper by Bindel Kleinberg and uh, Aren, which is a the sociologist Craghart writing that in the real world consensus is not reached. And so we care about the, the structure of he says that social scientists, you know, sociologists and others are likely to be more interested with explaining the lack of consensus, the variance in beliefs and attitudes that we see in actual influence context. And so Matt began to talk about that yesterday. And I want to give you now with your increased familiarity with the De Groot model, I want to tell you a bit more about that. So Matt did a great job setting this up. One of the central features of social networks is homophily, love of the same. It's observed on every important demographic and social dimension. We know from yesterday's talk in this recent nature paper, this pair of nature papers, that it's income homophily is very predictive of um, demographic, of, sorry, of economic mobility. Um, and we know that in schools, for example, you know, on dimensions we might care about independently like race, you have way less interaction across groups than under uniform mixing. So this is like a very robust and deep feature of, of networks. And at the same time, we know that polarization and disagreement are politically highly salient phenomena. So there are a lot of papers. We, Matt and I have a QJE paper in 2012, which was very motivated by disagreement. And recently, of course, throughout COVID and the 2016 election in the US and so forth, there's been a lot of writing of which I have some sample citations here describing the importance of polarization um, and documenting it in, on political and health and other issues. And so an extremely relevant question is what role does the network play in the structure and intensity of polarization and also what interventions might make a difference? So that's sort of the second, the second chapter of our little um, exploration today. So let me play this little video for you again this network. We, here I've set up the opinions differently. I've set up these guys to have the, the black initial opinion, these guys to have the white initial opinion. And I'm now having, I'm now letting the process run. This is two steps, four steps, 10 steps. You can see that even after 10 steps, this projector screen here kind of um, exaggerates it a bit. These guys do have some dark in their, in their opinion, but you can still see a very intense gradient after 10 steps of updating that perfectly tracks the sort of um, network structure in a way. So that's what the, and if, if you think about it, we, when we were studying the consensus stuff, we were interested in this one vector, which is like, who's gonna matter for determining this one real number opinion. But now there's a different thing, which is this whole spectrum of disagreement, right? So it's a sort of, if you'd like a second order piece of the theory, which is like, what happens before consensus, and this kind of stuff happens. 
So let me show you a, a little movie. This is a simpler network, but what I've done here is I've set up, I've set up um, people in a little two diamond network here to have different initial opinions. I just selected them you know, somewhat at random. And then I let them update and I'm playing the video for you in kind of continuous time. You can see that over time they are, so their opinions have updated quite a bit. And now you see that this, this left diamond is sort of on the left of this issue and let's call that the light. And then the right diamond is on the right. And over time, it is the, the disagreement is decaying but it takes quite a while for it to decay away. And here, what I've done is I've plotted these opinions over time. Um, you know, you see them converging to a consensus, which is between 0.2 and 0.3, or 2 and 3. I've given them, you know. Uh, so they're going here, but you can see these curves say how they're going there. And let me play, so let me just play this movie pausing it. So. At this point, you know, early on, they haven't, there's no, there's nothing relating their opinions to their, to their group membership that much, you know, the opinions are all over the place. But after we've let the process run for just a little bit of time, maybe over here, you see that there begins to be a lining up where you can already see kind of the left people here are, um, you know, being uh, found over, over here. And the right people are being found over there. So I think where I've stopped it is right about where the first separation occurs. And then if we let them update a little more, you know, maybe we stop it here. By this point, we can see there is a very clear gradient. These guys are all dark, these guys are all light. So they've separated. And then you kind of see that the groups, the rest of the convergence is at this group level, right? The groups are sort of the, this left group is moving slowly rightward, the right group is moving slightly leftward, but they're doing this kind of as a group. Right. So C is what opinions converge to, and we've already studied that. Matt mentioned yesterday that the, there's a, a, if you wanna know what the rate of this is, right? You can see this kind of an exponential decay. If you wanna know the rate of that decay, it turns out to be the second eigenvector of the updating matrix. And there's something else pretty cool, which is that we can tell how opinions are ordered. So there is a the magic vector, which I'll tell you more about, a vector called Q, which says in once all of this stuff has settled down, how are people ordered along the axis of opinions? Turns out there's an ordering which is independent of the initial opinions, independent of a lot of details that emerges in this world. So let's talk more about that. Let me state a math, math theorem for you. So this is stated by Demar Zovayanos and Zwiebel and then further studied by Matt and me in this, in this QJ paper I mentioned. So if you want to know the deviation of Mr. I from, from the eventual consensus opinion, well, first of all, the rate at which that deviation is decaying is given by the second, I should actually have put absolute value here. Let's assume the second eigenvalue is positive to keep things simple. The rate of decay is governed by the second largest eigenvalue of the matrix. But what's interesting is that the, the sort of direction of, de of deviation, where you are relative to others, is given by one number, Q. And what's this number? It's an eigenvector of the updating matrix, but it's the one associated with the second, with the second eigenvalue. So when we were studying consensus, we were focused on the eigenspace corresponding to the largest eigenvalue, one of a Markov matrix. Now, the second order, the second deviation will be governed by the second eigenvalue and its associated eigenvector. So we, here we've diagonalized, let's take our matrix to be diagonalizable. You have a, a eigenvector on the right here, Q2. And so to summarize what's going on, the speed of convergence is governed by the second eigenvalue and this ordering that we saw emerge in the little picture is, is, is actually an eigenvector of the network. And kind of remarkably, no matter how I configure their initial opinions, that spectrum, how they line up, is determined actually by the network alone, which is a fact you should be surprised by. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to maybe make it vivid why, why it's not, why it actually has some content, this fact. Um, so let me play another movie for you. What I've done now is I've set these people up to update about two issues. Let's call them guns and abortion, right? Issues that you might think people could have all sorts of combinations of views on. 
And each of these issues will be separately discussed in the network we've shown in the little two diamonds network according to a degree process. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you their opinions, you know, with these kind of tracer plots. Here are their opinions evolving. They're converging to a consensus, which you can kind of see there. That's the middle point that they're all flying toward. Um, they're getting there in some kind of way. So a movie is still playing, right? They're getting there in some kind of way. But maybe at this point, you kind of want me to do something, which I'll helpfully do. You might want me to zoom in because, you know, once they start getting close, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a camera which flies inward, zooms in to keep the scale of the picture equal to the scale of their disagreement. So let me show you that movie. Maybe play them. I don't know if I'll, I won't play. Well, yeah, I can play them simultaneously. So here you see the normalized picture. As they're flying together, the normalized picture shows you the details of how they're lining up on these two issues. So you see that they're lining up along some kind of axis, right? And what I want to flag is that on both issues, so let's let's start with this, this y-axis issue. So let, let's say that's abortion. Their political views are lining up in this order, like this purple person, then two people on top of each other, then this green person, then this, the, the, so forth, right? A per, each person has it as we go down the spectrum. And that's the exact same ordering as we see on the other issue, right? And that fact would emerge regardless of exactly how I set up the initial opinions generically. The only thing that the initial opinions would do is they would swing around the line itself. The ordering would be fixed, but the orientation of the line depends on the initial opinions. So this is, this is, this is the expression of unidimensionality that even though in principle their opinions could occupy this rich two-dimensional space or n-dimensional space, they'll actually end up all lined up along a line, right? So you should be, that's not at all an obvious. Um, so this is an explanation of um, why the political spectrum in the US is sort of one dimensional, okay, just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it helps us see the mathematical content. Yes, go ahead. So assuming that the two issues are like propagating in the same network. In the same network, absolutely. Yeah, so the same network, but two different issues. And so the last thing I want to mention is what is, you know, you might be, so it is still true that there's a question of how much polarization will there be, right? It could be, you kind of saw on one of these issues, there was actually much less disagreement than on the other issue. And so in math, the scale of polarization, the size of it is determined by this, by this scaling thing, A, and I can actually tell you what A is, this coefficient. This A is equal to the second, to a second eigenvector, Okay, it's actually the, the left hand second eigenvector over here times the vector of initial opinions. Okay, so that thing is, is also related to eigen things, but it's more subtle. You have to take the way that you set up the disagreement to begin with and, and, and take the dot product with some vector. So let's, let's get an intuition for that. So it's a left hand second eigenvector of W, it's the one associated with number two to be contrasted with the right-hand second eigenvector of W, which is the thing that governed their ordering, okay? So to better understand that, let me show you two examples. If you set up X0, this, the initial disagreement, to be in this way, which somehow tracks the underlying group structure, right? Then the dot product of P2 with that X0 will be big. It has a big projection onto the P2 is, I'm just telling you, happens to look exactly like this. So when I set up this X to be like this, it loads heavily onto P2. And this is the kind of disagreement that can be sustained for a long time. Hopefully you'll find that intuitive. It's set up to resonate with the network's own structure of sustaining disagreement. On the other hand, if I'd set up the initial opinion to be like this, this toggling thing, that happens to be basically orthogonal to P2. It's orthogonal to the network structure. And so this, will not sustain disagreement because it doesn't really pick up on, and actually this came up in Matt's um, talk yesterday, because he said, when you compute the spectral homophily, the lambda two of these social networks in real life, you sometimes get a very high number, but it doesn't lead to high um, income uh, segregation. And it doesn't lead to um, the persistence of immobility. And so, the reason for that is it may be that for some behaviors or beliefs, the disagreement is set up orthogonal to the biggest split in the network. And so it won't get, it won't sort of 
manifest in this way. So, so I think you learn, hopefully this area, you know, it's kind of interesting to me in these models, how quickly you get into some fairly subtle stuff. And I wanna make, uh, yeah. For the, so first of all, what are the conditions you need for the side two? Um, so not much, I, I, let's assume, let's say positive. So let's say the second largest eigenvalue will be positive, okay? Um, and I guess in general, it might be complex. So, and this is actually has something to do. So Matt and I wrote our QJE paper on homophily in the setting of the, the simple setting where you just take a, a weighted graph and you do this, you take an undirected graph, you normalize, so you get this de Groot matrix coming from an undirected graph. There, it turns out that even though the first eigenvector theory is pretty boring, this stuff is already pretty rich, right? So that's the that's sort of what Markov chain people call the reversible case. So most of what's known about these models is in that case. Some of it, like that lambda two controls the speed of convergence, there is a version of that for basically an arbitrary, you know, generic Markov matrix you have, of course, that result. But you, you say the side. So can you say that it's a little, little arbitrary graph? Is that a graph where the matrix W is just a random walk matrix coming from the graph G? <clears throat> what are your conditions you need? So let's say double. Is it a it's a, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, observation. it's stated as a little bit like physics, but take a, take a row stochastic matrix W. Um, <coughs> So let me say, let me say the, the, let me say one version. Take an undirected weighted graph, a symmetric matrix G, construct the Markov matrix as I described. Um, as long as your initial graph was, was connected, um, then this theorem will hold exactly, exactly as I as stated. Um, let's, uh, let's also make the weights generic. Not for cycles. Yeah, but I'm also going to make my initial G generic, so I don't have to worry about okay. generic, okay? Uh, generic. Just generic. Mean? Just drawn from the let the weights be be drawn from some measure absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. So I'm going to not worry about exactly zero weights or anything. Independently on the edges, so that's no, no. According to some joint distribution, just ruling out. I'm mean, to just rule out ties among eigenvalues and other non-generic things that would make me have to say more. Okay. Um, so yeah, but then you can have the you know this is and this is a standard. Markov chain mixing time type of analysis in, in eigenvalue <laughs> with eigenvalue techniques. Yeah, so just a clarifying question on that. So we are still in a reversible Markov chain, right? Or no? So here's where we get more into physics. Actually, everything I've told you is basically works even outside the reversible case. Yeah. But, and, and for this part, you can state a, rig a rigorous result. There's stuff I'm about to tell you where we've heavily used, people have, me and everybody else have used reversibility a lot where I don't think it's economically important. And I, so instead of open questions is about how to relax this. So let me actually tell you about that. Can um, I ask something yeah. well? Because in your diagonalization, you seem to have a condition that all the eigenvalues are different. Yes. So is I'm it saying- important? Not that just a- <laughs> Oh yes, why is that? Why wouldn't you just need that lambda one and lambda two? Are yeah. going to make there's a gap to lambda three. And right. Yeah, yeah. So I, this is more than this is actually for some later. Um, well, one thing that all different will give you is automatically you no know, Jordan blocks. You know, every, you just get everything separate. And, but there will be other other results for which I care about even lower eigenvectors. But for this one, you just need to separate the second and third in your your language. Okay. So I was wondering about the time. Like here, we are seeing that it's a long, uh, long run average, a uh, long run order, and eventually uh -huh. the second. So I think uh, there will be some time. Uh, the initial ordering does not follow. So I was wondering, uh, yeah, choose the, the time for this. So actually, let's go back. I think I have the picture. Um, yeah. Well, in, it, it's basically when the third I get so loosely, it's, it's when the third. That's governed by the ratio of the size of the third eigenvalue to the second, right? That once you one the the other other stuff dies away, like the third relative to the second. So so there's that other, there's another gap there. And if you have and so actually if you have neat ties or near ties among eigenvalues, this structure that sticks around will be um, will stick. This other random stuff will stick around longer and be richer. So 
But if you have a third eigenvalue, that's making the fast exactly. Yes. If we have time, so my actual question was: so if if I can map intuition from reversible Markov chains, if this kind of um, you know, obviously the first eigenvector has to do fish distribution. So for the second eigenvectors, you know, the left eigenvectors usually are kind of you can interpret it as kind of the most stable perturbation of the steady state, and then similarly the right has a like the sort of most stable perturbation of the state space. So is it right to just try to map that intuition to the econ language that you just described? Like that is why it gives the ordering. That's also why. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a good intuition that it's, it's this perturbation that's capable of sustaining itself the longest from yeah. the steady state prediction. Yeah. And so the left one just kind of translates to polarization. Right? Yes. Okay, it's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So your E eigenvector, just to get my, my mark of chain correctly, you see, your E is just a station of probability distribution. Exactly. Okay. So. And the eigenvector is for, and your Q2 is on the same side as the stationary distribution. Yes, yeah, so exactly. The, the Q that govern, we, no. So the Q is on the other side. Yeah. So here is the left hand side. Here, the right hand eigenvector, the, the first right hand eigenvector is only once. The second one is Q2. Yes. On, the, yes, yes. on the left, the first one is E or with people off the pi, right? And then this other one is P2, which is the one that uh, the one that we were using to dot dot with x in order to decide how big this distribution is going to be. So in the reversible case, these two are they're not exactly the same, but after but after a twist, if you suitably if you conjugate by a diagonal matrix, you actually P2 and Q2 are basically the same thing. But in general, they're they they're not. In, in a, and for interesting non so for outside my little favorite example, derived from an undirected graph, these two things could be quite different. And in the diagonalizable case, where sorry, in the yeah, in the case where all eigenvalues are real, right? The, so the case where um, basically your matrix is conjugate to a normal matrix, everything is easier. But a lot of what's interesting about this model, as you might, as I hope you see from this might emerge when there's some differences between P2 and P2 and Q2 might not track exactly the same thing, right? There's some room for, so that stuff, my, my quick sort of summary is that nobody has really zoomed in on that stuff and we don't know a lot about it yet. It's some, some it's worth exploring. I'll give you a super quick kind of related to that. So we've been talking about graphons a lot and here we can really start touching on some graphon stuff. Um, you know, we've learned that the, that the, Second eigenvalue governs the speed of convergence. It's associated with eigenvectors governing the median run structure of disagreement. We usually can't measure the whole network. If I ask you, what is the social network of updating in this room? Even if you did a full network census, you wouldn't be measuring exactly what I care about. You're asking maybe who you hang out with, but you, you know, what we really care about within the model is how much does my opinion influence your opinion? That's a very hard thing to measure at the pair level. So what we have a hope of actually getting that we might believe is a structural model, of course, with error in it, of how our attributes, like our academic field, our gender, our race, whatever you want to throw in there, affect our links, right? And so the question is, you know, if you, if all you could actually get, if, if we can't get the, the full precision of an exact knowledge of W, but we can approximate W as coming from a statistical model of how people's, you know, what Christian talked about the very first day and what we've been talking about multiple times, if, if our interactions are predicted by these attributes in a noisy way, how well does that commute with this model? If you had a model like that, how well could you sort of use the degree model without knowing exactly everything? And so that's kind of an important topic. So here's my little stochastic block model picture, right? We have these groups and they might have very complicated links, but if we sort of, somehow manage, first of all, to cluster these people so we know who's who. And then we look at the average linking probabilities across groups, and then we forget exactly the people and we just focus on this group level thing. You know, to what extent can thinking about this thing, a reduced system focusing only on the group level stuff, tell us information that we really care about about the original network, right? And so if you think about this in adjacency matrix terms, 
there's some, let's go back to the graph world. There's some zero one adjacency matrix among these groups, which is very complicated, very rich, very noisy. But if you kind of smooth it out and you only you average across the blocks, you get some very low dimensional structure, right? And the question is, to what extent can you analyze, can you carry through some of the analysis that I've told you about to the low dimensional, um, you know, I guess this is a, in my, maybe I'll leave it here. If you just blur your, if you make your eyes blur, you see the low dimensional version. Um, and so um, the hope, Sheer dense. Well, actually, we have results. Matt and I have results for links for oh, as long as you're willing to have a degree at least log n, you can have the results. I'll tell you uh, that you know. So one result we know is that you can is that if you take this. So let me talk. Be a little more precise. You can construct this representative agent system where. Instead of thinking of a link between person I and person J, you think of link, a link from group K to group L as the typical weight placed by a group K agent on all group L agents, right? So if degrees are growing, if my degree grows, you know, like 100, you can get a pretty good statistical prediction of what fraction of my friends are going to be, let's say, all the different races. And you can construct a fake degree matrix on the races. Let's assume those are the groups. Um, and the hope is that this gives you a good approximation of things we care about. But of course, the stochastic block model is a very crude approximation. You might say for income should be in there, right? And if I now want a model of the network where I don't just think linking probabilities in expectation are determined by race, but I also want some continuous variables in there. Now I have a graphon like object. I have a, a sort of smooth, you know, I have a rich set of attributes, which is somehow going to map into link probabilities. And then I'm going to want to do some version of the analysis I told you about with knowledge of the full network. And I'm gonna be curious about things like, can I you know, predict? So a simple question is, can I predict the eigenvalues? Can I predict the speed of convergence knowing only the large scale structure? And it turns out there's a beautiful theorem, which is that if you can write your adjacency matrix as probabilities of links plus a matrix of deviations E, and let's say these deviations are independent, then you can show that in operator norm or in spectral norm, your deviation matrix is going to have, um, you know, under assumptions, the typical thing that people do is show that that's O of root n, while the eigenvalues of your big adjacency matrix um, are going to be more like n, okay? And so, uh, or something, the key, the key, what really matters, so actually here I'll work in the dense case. If you have a dense network, then the eigenvalues of the main part, the predictable part, are going to be scaling like n, and the noise is going to be scaling like root n. So you can kind of pick up on the main structure in the adjacency matrix. Now, then you have to do a little work to translate all this business into the stochasticized, into the root matrices, right? So there's, if you look up, if you open your favorite random matrix theory book, the first results you'll see are more applicable to the, you know, for example, once you, once you do my normalization thing, you've introduced correlations. Now, whether, you know, how my, how my links are normalized depends on my other links. And so you have to deal with that, but people have, so you can see our QGE paper for some methods on how, how to do that. And in general, there's a beautiful theory um, in, that is surveyed in this nice monograph called Spectral Methods in Data Science for telling you how you can pull relationships between the eigen things of the expected matrix, the small and orderly linking probability matrix, and your big and noisy realized link matrix. So it turns out there's a theorem that helps you control eigenvalues, which you can use to control to show that you can in fact predict the second eigenvalue of the noisy matrix very well, knowing just the group structure. And you can even, there's a, a corresponding and, and higher powered theorem called the davis kahn theorem, which is about being able to relate the eigenspaces. And so even those vectors like P2 and Q2 are going to be predictable based on large scale structure, right? So we don't have, you know, given our time, I would love to dig into these, into these um, subtleties and I'm not gonna um, dig into them in any richness, but I do wanna say that there's a whole set of fascinating questions that, that use these kinds of techniques to say how much is predictable about degroot processes based on group level structure. And this theory, certainly in the degroot literature has been developed exclusively in the reversible case, in the case where, the weight matrix is derived from some 
symmetric matrix. But in real life, asymmetry is an influence. If you think about me following, you know, Taylor Swift or, who, or whoever, those are asymmetric influence relationships. And so asymmetry is an influence are first order for anything you would want to use the de Groot model for. But mathematically, especially in this disagreement theory, we know almost nothing about uh, what is what any of these results look like with this, with uh, is without the reversibility. So I think that's an area, it might be a little too far beyond current techniques, but I, I have, if you want to talk to me, I have a bunch of... So you imagine, for example, that process and having... So if I want to generate this asymmetric matrix, usually I need two features, right? So then I have sort of a feature for outlinks and inlinks, and you have one for outlinks and inlinks, and then if you connect, you will use sort of one of the two feature sets to connect in one direction and the other. Mm -hmm. Good, exactly. So that would be, I, that's, a, that's a nice model. I, I hope it was audible on there, but Christian suggested a model where you sort of have features that predict links in one direction, features that predict links in the other direction, they don't need to line up. And you could try to sort of basically think of your, you know, that would be ultimately you project onto a network that looks directed, but it has some structure. Go ahead. Sorry, I mean, just to understand, I mean, when you move to the asymmetric, like to the non symmetric case, is the issue that you lose like eigenvector eigenvalue stability, like you lose Davis cup, right? Is that one of the issues? Well, there are many issues. So you're saying what's the issue to pushing beyond? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess like there's this usual example is where, like, if you take a non, like, a non symmetric square matrix, you add some tiny noise in one corner and that completely mm -hmm. messes all the Stuff. So I guess that would like yeah exactly so just kind of exactly out without it's just that people have used the symmetry assumption to rule out that problem and all others. In reality, the things that go really wrong are much more are uh, you know there are counterexamples like that, and basically I think much weaker conditions would suffice to give give you the convergence. Uh, but I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Okay. No, 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 I was just trying to understand like what the barriers are to pull in the Oh no, this is why. So this is actually why I don't think that there are um this is not like some areas where people are these these open problems are I think for the most part very low-hanging fruit because I don't think people have been trying that hard. There are these heuristic things people believe because the first people to do them, in this case us, were too lazy to push beyond that case. And I think there are many the economically important extensions. I don't think require fundamentally new techniques. They just require doing it carefully. And, and so I'm pointing out that in some of these things, the, non, the, the directed case hasn't been understood well, but could be with a little work if you're curious about it, is my, um, is my, is my feeling, okay? Um, so, this is just a summary of the things I said for display on the YouTube channel. Okay, so we have about 15 minutes and uh, I, I'm going to move. So I will begin my next module. Let me just quickly mute the display. I wanna talk a little bit about, I, don't bother with that. I wanna talk about a, a, about a different class of models which is closely related, but moves closer to a, to a different part of economics um, which Matt briefly mentioned. Um, so we've been working with a mechanical updating de Groot process, but I kind of told you that it was a benchmark useful for thinking about richer economics, richer game theory. And Matt has already brought up sort of game theory and how network games allow us to link network ideas to fundamental economic concepts like externalities and so forth. Um, and I'm gonna tell you now at the end of this lecture in the beginning of the next one, that understanding some of, so the de Groot model, we could keep our heads free of the subtleties of economics, optimization, all of that. It was, we just had a mechanical process. I'm gonna tell you that with the intuition you've developed by, by thinking about that, you can understand a lot about interesting network game models, um, which have more optimization and economics in them. And a virtue of modeling agents who have preferences is that we can ask questions about welfare. So that's maybe a distinguishing hallmark of the economic approach to networks, that if you're just doing the de Groot model as a you know, simple mechanical model of how people behave, then whatever you want to assess about it has to come out as extra, you, know, you just say, I'm curious about this measure of disagreement or polarization or whatever. 
if you have an economic model underneath, there's a ready-made set of questions like, are these people behaving efficiently? What could we do to improve their welfare that come from the preferences that give rise to the behavior? That's one of the glories of economic models. And so I want to show you in a very simple setting how we can kind of bring in an economic model that inherits much of what we've learned uh, from our de Groot studies so far. So we're going to study a game, which is a coordination game with continuous actions. There's going to be a motive for people to take actions close to personal ideal points or favored actions. And you're also going to be interested in your actions being close to some others. So we have this um, community. You could, there are two examples I'll talk about. One is if you imagine a pretty, so here the actions can be in some high dimensional space, uh, Rn, which doesn't have to do with number of people, but maybe there's like six choices we're making, maybe technological choices. How much do I use tech? Do I use Linux or Windows? You know, choices in some technological space. Let's make it continuous. And when you choose this bundle, you like being closer to your coworkers because it's easier to coordinate, but you also have your favorite tools. Another model, which maybe I'll focus on more, is opinions. When you choose a political position on an issue like affirmative action or you know, free trade, you have your own views about what's right, but to the extent that you're not really receiving much information, a lot of this is about social, you know, you don't like constantly feeling like your friends all think you're, you're crazy. And so people, again, have a, have a motive to keep their opinions closer or their expressed opinions at least closer to what their friends say. And the basic questions are, how do the primitives, the ideal points, what people fundamentally like to do or believe, and also their, um, the network they're connected in, how does that affect welfare in equilibrium? And if you had a planner who could start to intervene and do things like you know, show people ads again or, or do some other intervention that would change their behavior, what would be that person's strategy if they wanted to increase welfare or decrease it? If you're Putin and you're trying to create discord in the United States prior to the election, what's your best bet to exploit the network structure? It's those kinds of questions. Um, and so we're going to, I'm going to tell you, but before getting to, and that's where we're going to go, but I want to tell you, and maybe this is the, will be the last main thing for today. I want to tell you about a coordination game and how it ultimately reduces to, so I'll tell you how we exactly model it, and I'll tell you how it comes down to very similar math. So we have individuals, they're taking actions, and let's make everything real valued now again. So they're taking real actions. Every individual has a favorite action, Fi. Any I and J interact. Uh, so any I and J can interact, and if they play, if they meet each other to work together, let's say, they're going to get the following payoff. They're going to get a certain disutility from miscoordinating with the person they meet. And beta is how much they care about the other person. And then one minus beta, the remaining weight, is the distance of their action from their favorite action. So the way, and the way this works is we pick our actions once and for all. Then we meet whoever we're going to happen to you know, interact with that day. And we get the payoffs based on the actions we chose in the morning when we interact in the afternoon. And you know, so if beta is high, I care a lot about coordinating with whoever I'm going to meet. Uh, and, but I do have some weight on my favorite action. And the network is just governing. So GIG, GIJ will be a graph here, which governs the probability, or the share of time, if you want, that I and J interact. So my expected payoff will be a weighted average of my interactions with every person I might meet. So I, I'm in a work group, and I might meet you or you or you or you. With each of you, I get this kind of payoff. And my real payoff will be the average of all of those weighted by how likely I am to meet you. Maybe just a cosmetic. Why do you have this negative numbers there? Yeah, so in, in economics, we often we always maximize. And a statistician would call this a loss function and say you want to oh, yeah. So I'm sorry about that. Maybe something. That's it, yeah. It's we learn nothing else about it. <laughs> you know, nothing else about economists. <laughs> you write max, not min. Our intro mathematical physicists have partition functions sum of e to the plus beta energy. So you have these energies that you want to maximize. Maximize. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So when you choose an action, you're pulled toward your favorite action, but you're also pulled toward your neighbor's actions, and you should be. That should remind you of the group. And one question we could ask is, what's a Nash equilibrium given a vector of favorite points? So if I bring you a vector of favorite points, which is just determined by people's childhoods and so forth, and then they play this game, what actions will they choose in the morning? 
So we simultaneously choose actions in the morning, not seeing anything or learning anything. We just know the network. We choose our actions and then we get these payoffs. So let's analyze that game. And then welfare, right now that we have these payoffs, we can define welfare to be the sum of payoffs in equilibrium. So then you could imagine later we'll do this, you bringing in a planner who has some control on F, who can mess with F a little bit. And that person might be malevolent, wanting to minimize our utility as much as he can with his power to mess with F, or benevolent seeking to help us all out. So let me give you a, a picture. So I'm gonna draw a lot of pictures in this part where I have, here I have a circle network. So here the GIJs are all, everybody spends half their time with their right-hand neighbor and half their time with their left-hand neighbor. And let's say we have a vector of favorite points where Mr. One and Mr. Two are taking actions minus one. I'm gonna depict those kind of vectors visually by coloring the nodes according to the sign of, of F. So we're gonna have both positive and negative numbers here. And then later, the size of these various nodes will correspond to the size of the entry of a vector. So any vector you're thinking of on the network, I can depict by coloring and sizing the nodes, okay? It's just a visual convention. And so here we have a vector of favored actions where these Northeasterners happen to like the, the you know, minus one action and these, these people happen to like the uh, plus one action. And then you can ask what that will translate to in equilibrium. So I pick some beta, a half maybe, and I let these people play the game and you can see that they're gonna conform their actions to uh, other people's preferences. Because if you're here, like, you know, basically you know that these people, so these people are deep in the south, Southwest and they are surrounded by everyone who shares their favorite actions. So in equilibrium, they don't have to adjust much. They end up playing close to their favorite action and their neighbors like to play their favorite action. Whereas if you're more on the edge, it turns out that you're somehow influenced by the fact that you're on the border. One of your neighbors likes the other action. So they're pulled toward it. So they're you're pulled toward it. So you can solve for the equilibrium and you get some kind of shape like this, right? And so um, now you can ask simple questions like, you know, take this network versus this network. Um, how much disagreement will there be? Like if you, you can ask a question like, how much polarization ultimately will there be in behavior you know, neither of these, for a fixed beta, so unlike the DeGroote model, for a fixed beta, these people are not gonna have consensus. They're gonna have reason to maintain their differences. But you can ask in this network, how much difference will they maintain versus in this network, right? You might have an intuition based on homophily that actually, you know, in this network, they're going to be much better at sustaining the disagreement they have, whereas in this network, it'll get attenuated away. But now with this welfare function in the picture, there's another question which is which network would you rather live in, right? And it's gonna turn out that under the canonical welfare function, you actually strongly prefer to live in this polarized looking network because the people surrounding you agree with you. So even though there'll be big global polarization, it'll, it won't have much of an effect on people's local worlds and, and the utility. So a utilitarian welfare, utilitarian actually likes uh, this world a lot more. So there's, and so we'll, Let's say this edge is through Nash bargaining with each other and sort of find that way. So you and I make a compromise. We sort of use a Nash bargain on that edge. We get to equilibrium. Very good. So let's actually do that right now. I'm not going to do Nash bargaining, but so I'm going to quickly do equilibrium and then I'll do your dynamics and, that, and we'll stop there. So I started at 305 and I'll end at 335. And, um, so here's the payoff. And what I've done now, so this is the payoff, you know, I've, I've now averaged over your, over your friends and I'm, I've brought back a matrix W because I'm gonna study it. I, well, it's, w is an arbitrary uh, matrix, which I'm, I'm, for a little while, I'm not even gonna require row stochastic, just put any matrix W here. So this is the expected, expected payoffs in the game we've been studying look like this. Um, equilibrium behavior, well, you can, so one thing you can do, and this is the whole idea of Nash equilibrium, you take other people's actions as given, you take them as numbers that you can't affect, and you think how would, for any actions that they might take, how would I best respond? What would be my AI? So that's a very simple optimization problem, right? Taking all these numbers AJ of other people as, as fixed numbers, what is your best response action? What action do you maximize as your utility? So you take a derivative, you, you solve this problem and you get that the best response action that you have is a weighted average of, well, 
it's so actually let, let's agree, let's take w to be a row stochastic matrix this is saying that it's an average of your neighbor's actions right wij times the action they're taking plus the remaining weight on your so this is an average of your neighbor's action you put weight beta on that and put weight one minus beta on your favorite point that's your best response I Take the derivative so that two, there will there will be a two, but it, it appears in both places and then it cancels out. Yeah. So you take the derivative, and then you know I get if I write that system that I wrote up there, if I if I take that equation and I write it in vector terms, I get this kind of equation. And if I solve it, if I bring all the a stuff over to one side and I and then I invert, I get a characterization of equilibrium actions that depends exclusively on known stuff, the network and the favorite actions. And I can use a formula that you all know for writing out that inverse. I can write it as a, as a sum of beta, beta to the power t times w to the power t, right? Um, and you can see, you can immediately see that the same objects that determine de Groot opinions at various steps of updating show up in this game but now the way that you get your consensus action, it's almost as if you took a degrude process, you let it run, and then you picked a random time to stop it geometrically. It, that's actually mathematically what the right-hand side is. So in some sense, the network game cap, it captures actions which are very closely related to degrude opinions, but now in this Nash equilibrium reasoning. Go ahead. Thank you, equality, the second equality, work either whatever you want should be invertible matrix or this beta w times w should be small yeah w is well stochastic yeah. beta yeah. is a number less than one right okay so that's why the matrix is invertible and moreover all the entries of, all the entries of this inverse are non-negative numbers that comes from that a clarifying question. So, of course, this depends on the geometry of your network structure your neighbors like you illustrated um but so in that example you gave us f was super simple it was plus or minus one right so usually um, it looks like the subjective would not only depend on the network structure of your neighbors, but maybe like the geometry of the action space, right? Because if you have many neighbors and then the distance is only measured from you to your favorite action, uh -huh. like if their favorite action is sort of closer to yours, that could also affect things, right? So, so somehow that seems right, but I'll tell you that if I set up exactly this, this utility function, uh -huh. In an arbitrary Euclidean space, just replacing this with norm squared, every formula I'm writing would remain true. So, of course, the geometry would matter insofar as it determined distances. It goes through. Yes. It goes through. So, so this is actually a better theory. You know, if you're working in any space where you have, you know, norms that look like a two norm, be as rich as you want, you can run this theory. And De Groot actually observed that when he was doing his thing. He said. You can update over distributions or whatever you want, and the math all makes sense, right? So that's a free generalization um, that we have. So you have this matrix R, which I call R because in econometrics, this is called the reduced form effects. If you look at W, they're like the structural effects, the ones that govern the sort of direct person-to-person -person influence. But once you roll together all the implications of them, you get this matrix which captures the full equilibrium impact, right? So naively, the, the first order structural impact of my action on you is like my favorite point increases, so my action increases, so maybe that has a direct effect on Nicole because we're friends. But once you've rolled that through the whole network indirect updating system, it's going to have an effect on, you know, Kimon over there because it, and so the, the R captures all those indirect effects, adds them all up in a way that, of course, depends on the coordination weights and so forth. And so Last, and, and then maybe this is a good place to stop. We see a powerful analogy here between a, the De Groot model and our model, because actually, you know, I forgot to write an important stipulation here. If you take beta up to one, so you take the coordination motive to be very strong, that should be a stipulation here, and I'll correct it when we resume next time. When the coordination motive is very strong, then this sum will put most of its weight on very high powers. And so the powers that will matter will be W to like a thousand. And so what will converge to will be a weighted average of our favorite points, weighted by what? It turns out exactly our eigenvector centralities. So the beta to one limit, the high coordination concern limit of this model recovers the De Groot consensus, 
right? But before you get to the, but if beta is far away from one, you have some disagreement left, which is picking up that second and third and so forth eigenvalues and is giving us a much richer structure of disagreement, which you can then ask about how can I, you know, how would a planner want to manipulate that? And is the amount of disagreement in equilibrium efficient? And so those questions, so next time when we wrap up, we're going to do a very quick completion of network game theory, which I'm going to do, I'm going to sort of pick some highlights, but I think it's important that we do see there's beautiful work by, by for example, uh, Bindel, Kleinberg, and, and uh, Aran, which I want to mention. And then the main topic of next time will be, uh, someone sent me this amazing picture. I don't know if you can see, it says eigenpayments. This is apparently a real, a real company, but um, people use these models for thinking about macroeconomic systems and bank systems and all sorts of interesting um, real, what, what you know, your lay, lay, lay person friends might think of as economics. Um, and it turns out we can use a lot of the same insights to think about really first order questions around macroeconomic volatility and bank regulation. And so I'll at least give you a taste of that in the fourth and final networks lecture. So that'll be next time. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, everybody, just before you go, I just wanted to remind you that um, we have a town hall for the uh, like program participants about like structuring reading groups and everything for the rest of the semester. So we'll hold it in this room, Christian. Yes. At uh, four. Yeah, at four. So. Like, you know, so, like, first, I'm going to talk to you about the first time I'm going to talk to you about the first time I'm going to talk to you about the first time I'm going to talk to you about the first time I'm going to talk to you about the first time I'm going to talk to you about the first time I'm going to talk to you about